Good evening, one and all. Thank you for coming out on this uh, inclement weather evening. Welcome to the Jersey City Public Schools Town Hall meeting. Uh, I'm going to now turn you over to our uh, board president and member of the Finance Committee, uh, Ms. Iofi. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. I, like Dr. Fernafel said, thank you so much for coming out, not just in the inclement weather, but also on short notice. And I must acknowledge that fact and specifically thank the administration for pulling all this together. On a short notice, I want to explain as to uh, why, because this goal for those of you who have been following our board meetings has been um, in, in the makes for some time. Um, you may remember that at the end of the last school year, the Board of Education has created a set of goals for the year, and one of these goals was to hold a series of town halls, preferably quarterly, on specific important topics that reflect the priorities of our district strategic plan and provide an opportunity, not just for a board meeting type setting, but for an, a more interactive dialogue while providing valuable information to our public. That is what this is. And so this meeting is not being live streamed, however it is being recorded so that it could be uh, placed on our website, on the district's website for reference to, for the community and anyone else who, who wishes to take a look. This is our very first meeting, so please um, you know, we're making this up as we go along. We want to be as productive and as formative as possible. And one of my personal goals that came out of various conversations, debates, and talks with the community is that to try and, uh, that's why we created a topic, demystifying the budget process. Um, I know many of you follow our meetings, many of you watched the special meetings prior to the budget vote, but still I find that a lot of our members of the public don't fully understand what the Board of Education members do with regard to the budget, what their responsibility is, what the expectations are. And so what I brought with me, and I'm not going to take up a lot of time, and I know we're already 10 minutes in, so I don't want to take advantage but this is what I will be reading from, just a few, a few items. Um, the board's role in finance. So you don't have it. This is part of my uh, school board training that we receive as, you know, as, as we, we're required to take governance one, which is board's roles and responsibilities. We do hold, hope to hold a town hall on that topic alone, if time permits, to explain what exactly the board's roles are. Um, and governance two is dedicated specifically to f f finances and our responsibility, our role the expectations, and the breakdown of what the board does, what the administration does, and what the community input is. So that's what I'm just going to briefly put it out. Um, the overview of the parties involved in the budget making process and in the district's finances is the community, which is you, and that is the taxpayers and also the municipal government. The New Jersey Department of Education, which is the commissioner of education and the executive county superintendent, and then us sitting here, the school district and the school team, which is the Board of Education, the Chief School Administrator, also known as the Superintendent, the Business Administrator, who is also Board Secretary, and our financial responsibility as the Board is to ensure financial integrity of the district by providing thorough and efficient education at a price that the community can afford. And you all know what I mean by saying that because that's when all the tax levy conversations comes in, come in and such. Board's financial responsibilities are narrowed down to creation of policy, development of policies to ensure financial oversight and monitoring, negotiations such as labor negotiations and reviewing of different contracts, transportation, providing transportation to all public and non-public students as needed and required by statute and policy, audits, which is what the business administrator um, requests on a regular basis, and bids. You often hear these items on the regular agendas that we approve monthly, bids over the threshold, <coughs> under the threshold, and that entire process. Finally, what does the school district do? The chief school administrator, which is the superintendent, is the financial manager of the district. He or she, in this case, is responsible for budget development and communication with the entire staff. Implementation of district goals that, is support, that are supported by the budget. 
I refer you to the district strategic plan, which outlines those goals and priorities, such as anything from academic achievement, family involvement, social emotional learning, and operations, which is personnel, finances, and everything else, infrastructure. Superintendent is responsible for the implementation of board's financial policies and district procedures, and responsible for safe, efficient, sustainable resource management. The business administrator is the chief financial officer of the district. He or she is responsible for budget planning and administration, supervises and coordinates all business affairs, month, provides monthly reporting on all financial transactions, and has oversight of facilities, food service, transportation, and benefits. Community, you are the taxpayers. You support the school district through the payment of property taxes, and you set the high expectations for a quality education. Municipal government is part of the community. They collect the property taxes and distribute to the school district. New Jersey Department of Education is comprised of Commissioner of Education, who ensures effective, efficient expenditure of funds. Each district must show that it has cost-sharing arrangements. Executive County Superintendent represents the commissioner on a county level and review, reviews tentative budget to ensure that all legal requirements are met. And that's pretty much it. What's left is the budget process, which is the financial expression of the district's educational goals, and that is what Dr. Dennis will present to you today. And it translates the educational visions and needs for the community into actual dollars. As a board member, we don't need to be able to balance the district's books, but we must ensure that the books do balance. You may hear the same concerning administering of schools. The board members do not administer schools. They do not tell each school or each individual employee what to do, but our role is to make sure that all the schools are well run, and we do that through the superintendent. And that's pretty much it. I thank you, and I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Fernafel. All right, at this time, we'll have opening remarks from Dr. Fernandez, our superintendent. Good evening, welcome. Um, we really are here to explain what different topics that keep coming up, just so everyone's on the same page. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fronafo because we're here to learn about the budget um, as we prepare the 24-25 school year for the budget. Uh, we said goodbye to our ESSA funds, so um, we'll see. At this point, we're waiting for the state funding. And I apologize, I, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my two colleagues because they're so far away from me. I, I fail to acknowledge them. We have with us our two brand new trustees and I thank them for participating in, in, in this venture. We have Detective Dijon Morris and Ms. Alpa Patel. Detective Morris currently chairs the Finance, Facility and Technology Committee and in that capacity, he meets with the business administrator, both of them, um, in a committee on a, on a monthly basis to receive the preliminary reports on the agenda items that we review. Thank you. Thank you, President Iofi, from running away with my script, which I was about to introduce the trustees. <clears throat> but I do want to say we have two newly elected trustees, and they have taken uh, their hats off and jumped head on first in uh, to tackle the issues that, that are facing the district at this time. I, I, I want to try, or endeavor to try, to demystify the budget or, and the process. And this is what we hope that we're going to do. <clears throat> now, it's defined. We just don't put the budget together. We are guided by statutes and by administrative code. The statutes are 18A, and that is a whole book of statutes. It's about three inches thick. That covers all of the educational process in the state of New Jersey. And the corresponding code, New Jersey Administrative Code, is 6A23A, Fiscal Accountability, Efficiency, and Budgeting Procedures. And I've outlined the statutes that govern the budget preparation, the notification to the districts of the aid payable and budget submissions, the contents of the budget and the format, and the public hearing. Uh, 
Corresponding with the New Jersey Administrative Code, we have the standard operating procedures for business functions, the financial and human resource management systems, and access controls. This was put into the accountability regulations because personnel is about 80% of the budget, even before you start the process. So it is the most uh, difficult one to fill because you're dealing with staffing and vacancies and filling positions and transfers, etc. as you move through the school year. The personnel tracking and accounting. Because when we submit the budget to the department, I have all the numbers in the right accounts, but those accounts that generate salaries, I must have a listing of all of the employees and the total amount of the employees budgeted to that line has to match. It can't be some mystical number. So it's very important to, to submit this or the budget will not be approved. So it's very important for this particular code about the tracking and accounting of personnel. Then of course we have the facilities maintenance and the repair scheduling and the accounting of what we do with our facilities. Not only the operations of our custodial and maintenance staff, but all of our repairs, all of our renovations, all of the major updates and upgrades to the district, all has to be accounted for in specific line accounts. And of course the procurement is another whole issue. The New Jersey State Department of Treasury, uh, we have to have for what we call a qualified purchasing agent, uh, which has to have that training uh, to know what you can do, what you can't do, who you can do business with. For instance, every vendor that we do business with must have a, a business registration certificate issued by the Department of Treasury. If they don't have that certificate, we cannot do business with them. Not that we don't want to do business, we're precluded from doing that because when we get audited, that will be an audit finding. Uh, also under the uh, regulations, we, uh, the commissioner, uh, through the executive county superintendent, approves the budget. So we have to submit the preliminary budget after the board adopts it to the county superintendent for the review and approval. Once that happens, it comes back to the district for further discussion by the district, and we have to then advertise that budget and set it up for the public budget hearing. That usually takes place at the end of April, early May, and at that time, then the board has the opportunity to make any changes uh, that may have to be made from the initial adoption of the preliminary budget, uh, and then adopt the final budget. Once that's adopted, that is your budget for the next school year. And then also we have the budgetary controls and over expenditure of funds. There is a resolution every month on the finance board agenda, which is the certification of funds, which is usually done by the chief financial officer, that would be yours truly, certifying that we have sufficient cash to do business for the remainder of the school year. Now we'll get into the budget process. Now I, I only, you have about uh, six, pages of the process. We will, the text of what I'm going to be giving you will be available tomorrow on the district's website. But the budget process. Now the process varies each district because districts are small, they're large. But here in Jersey City, the process began on November 20th, 2023. The business office budget staff, including this SBA and the assistant SBA, we met with 50 plus administrators. Those are our principals, our supervisors, our department heads. Our budget meetings focused on, one, the table of organization. The table of organization is the staffing, which is the biggest part of the budget. And two is the program budget, what each school needs to get through the school year, teaching supplies and materials, extra compensation funds, security, field trips, those, our program budget items. Now, we have a formula. The formula for developing each school program budget is determined by the ASSA. The ASSA is Application for State School Aid. We have a count that is, has to be certified as of October 15th every year. 
So for the 24-25 school year, our count that we certified on October 15th, 2023, those numbers, they will be able to calculate from those numbers what our state aid will be. So this is extremely important to have this correct because based on the enrollment, if your enrollment goes up, your state aid goes up. If your enrollment goes down, your state aid goes down. Now, what we've done, for an example, I have the Jersey City Public School number one. So let's say their enrollment count as of October 15, 23 was 490 students. The program budget allocation, what we've done is we determined $500 per student times the 500, that 490 students would be $245,000. So that particular school with that enrollment would have a program budget for the school year of $245,000. Of course, we have to add the staffing, which comes later. Now in January, which is this month, uh, we have already begun to complete the preliminary staff and program budgets for Fund 11. We then total both Fund 11 and Fund 15. Most districts outside of the previous 31 Abbott districts only have to deal with Fund 11. But those Abbott districts, which have now turned into 78 at-risk districts, have a Fund 15. Fund 15 is a school-based budget. So we have to load each individual school-based budget, which is Fund 15, and then we total that in with the Fund 11 to make the total budget. Now, what we do is, after we have all of these numbers, and we're not quite finished yet, uh, we estimate the district's revenue sources. And then we calculate the preliminary or the estimated budget for the 24-25 school year. Now, following these tasks, we meet with the superintendent and designated senior staff to review the budget and determine any increase to the tax levy. A draft of the preliminary estimated budget then is presented to the finance committee. It's sometimes early February, we try to get to it at least early February if we can, but it all depends on how we get our numbers from, from State Aid and from Trenton. And then it goes to the board either in late February or early March for review and discussion so that any changes or uh, questions that have to be answered, uh, then we can formulate our resolution for the preliminary budget, which the board will have to adopt in March. Now, of course, the bottom line is your expenditures cannot exceed revenues. Now, at this juncture, the preliminary 24 school year budget, we have it planned on our calendar for adoption by the board on March the 18th, uh, 2024. That is a caucus meeting. The final budget to be adopted by the board will be on April 25th, 2024, if these dates fit into the calendar, which we have not yet received from the Department of Education. Now, the New Jersey Department of Education Office of Fiscal Policy and Planning, they send us a calendar. And usually in January, the budget is open on the New Jersey homeroom with their calendar. I'm surprised we haven't received it. I thought we might get it today, but I could get it tomorrow or uh, Friday. If not, definitely it, it'll be before the end of January, so it'll be early next week. Then we will receive a notice from the uh, commissioner that uh, the New Jersey Home Room has opened the district's budget. So then we can go in and also with the calendar. And the calendar tells you when you need to have documents submitted to the county office to move forward. In February, and it's usually the last day of February, that the governor makes his annual state address. Now, uh, sometimes it's the 28th, although we have the 29th this year, but we haven't received when he will make the address to Governor Murphy. But we will have that in the calendar. When he makes that address, within 48 hours of that address, then uh, the uh, budget, the state aid, is loaded into the homeroom so each district knows what they will be receiving in state aid for the next school year. Uh, in March, there will, be a, there will be several dates listed in March when we have to adopt the budget, the preliminary budget, and then file it with the executive county superintendent. Once we do that, then that's up to the county office for their team to review it. If they have any questions, we have discussion back and forth. 
when they approve that, then the district is notifying that your preliminary budget is approved. Once we receive that, then we have to determine when we're going to have our public budget hearing. So if our date that we have in our calendar is in the time frame, and they usually give you within two weeks where the districts can have a public hearing, then we will advertise the budget and we have to notify the county superintendent when it is advertised, when it will be in the paper, and then send them a copy of the actual what was in the paper. Uh, then that goes to the board, and then the board at that time, when we have our public hearing, may make changes to the, bu to the budget. They either make increases or decreases or changes in account lines, and then adopt the final budget. Once that budget is adopted, then it goes back to the county office and then goes to the municipality by May 19th to certify the tax levy. So that's usually April, May. But we have it scheduled for the 25th, and if it fits into the time calendar, that's when we will do our public hearing on the final adoption of next year's school budget. I'd like to go over some definitions because these particular areas all affect how you put the budget together. Now, the tax levy, this is the amount of revenue that is raised through property taxes to support the general fund. And it's more than 50% of the entire budget. We have what is called a budgeted fund balance. Now, we've been fortunate enough the last few years the district has had some additional surplus. They call it excess surplus. That is listed in your uh, budget um, software when it's released to you from the Department of Ed. And you have areas you may use it uh, either of, uh, for, to increase the budget or, or you may restrict it for certain items. However, the budgeted fund, these are surplus funds. They are from prior year budgets used as revenue in future budget years, or unused appropriations, and we did have unused appropriations from the 22-23 budget that we were able to budget in this year, the 23-24 budget. We had over $13 million, and that means that's less money we have to go to the taxpayer for. We anticipate we probably will have that again for the next year budget. Then there's extraordinary aid. Now, extraordinary aid is different than the state aid for what was called discretionary state aid. This is state aid provided to the district for special education costs that are associated with our out-of-district placements for our students. If we're unable to provide a particular program for a special ed student in district, then they must go to what we call an out-of-district placement. Extraordinary aid is tuitions that are uh, in excess of $40,000 for a public entity. The additional money, you qualify to receive extraordinary aid. Sometimes you don't get the whole boat, but you get something back. And for students that we have to put in a private school approved by the department, those cost over $55,000, then we get extra revenue for that. Now, we were very lucky for our last school year, we received better than $4 million in extraordinary aid. So we use some of those funds, again, to offset the budget so we don't have to go to the taxpayer and increase the levy. SEMI, SEMI is the uh, Special Education Medicaid Reimbursement Initiative. And we have, when we get our software, there's a particular number that's in the budget that you have to budget. It's not an option. This is the number. You have to budget it. And if you want to change that number, you have to provide the county office with a whole explanation as to why you want to budget less uh, in it, and you have to certify that that's what you need, and then it's up to the executive county superintendent to approve that if we can. We have been budgeting the 90%. And so we don't have to deal those because we do have those kinds of revenues that we can get for to provide those services to our particular students who are under the Medicaid initiative. Capital reserve. These are surplus funds that are reallocated from fund balance and set aside for future capital improvement projects. 
We were fortunate enough in this budget to, to allocate $15 million to the capital reserve. And I'm happy to report that we, are com we have committed that entire $15 million, plus other monies that we had available, to begin to update our facilities throughout the entire district. We have over $20 million in projects going on right at the, as we speak. Debt service. These are funds for payment of principal and interest on outstanding bonded debt. Uh, we do not have any bonded debt for, for this school year, but next school year we will because we just approved uh, an energy savings improvement program. And we had to go out for bonding on that, so we sold $58 million in bonds. So we will be, have to pay those back over a number of years. However, that, those, that, that's funded from what we've already budgeted in our utilities budget. Because the savings that we will receive from doing these particular upgrades, so in other words, we're not going to increase our utility costs, we're not going to decrease it, but if we're, let's say, budgeting, for an example, $10 million, well now our, because we're making these energy savings upgrades, we now will only spend $8 million. Well, we have the 10 million, so the 2 million will go to pay the bonds back. So it, it doesn't add to the tax levy moving forward. These are our accounting funds. And each school district has to deal with these funds, except if you're not Abbott, you don't have to do the fund 15. Fund 11, this is where all our general current expenses are budgeted and are spent from. And they, these expenditures include here would be regular program instruction costs, administrative and other support services, costs related to providing the district's normal day-to-day -day operations. Fund 12 is strictly for capital outlay. These are items that are funded by general fund revenues and they include increases in the general fund capital reserve account, the equipment purchases, facilities acquisition and construction services. For equipment purchases, any purchase greater than $2,000 has to be paid from the capital outlay. It cannot be paid from Fund 11. Anything under the 2,000 is considered a supply. So that's where the Fund 12 comes in. Fund 20, this is our special revenue account. This does not require any um, uh, deposit from a tax levy. It is totally grant funds that we receive, and these are proceeds from revenue sources They are restricted. For instance, we have our Title I grants and Title II, Title III, Title IV, IDA. They are restricted for specific uses, but we must keep track of them and report them in Fund 20. And I have some of them listed here. And from year to year, that changes. So one year it can be 200 million, and next year it could be two. 240 million, it could be 150 million, it depends. Now our Fund 20 revenue will go down next year because we have no longer have ESSER funds. We've had ESSER 2, ESSER 3, those funds will no longer be available. Our ESSER 2 funds were all expended as of September 30th, 2023. The ESSER 3 funds, what is remaining, must be spent all by September 30th, 2024, this year. Now, we have taken, and when you get the ESSA funds, you have certain areas you have to allocate it for. They did give us a lot of facilities money to upgrade indoor air quality, uh, lighting, etc. areas. And I was able, and through the board's approval, we were able to deposit $64 million of ESSA funds into the ESIP program together with the $58 million that we raised to create the biggest energy savings improvement program ever in the history of New Jersey. Our program is even bigger than Newark School District, $122 million. We've already started many of those projects. Uh, one of them will be completely updating all of the LED lighting throughout the entire district and every building. That was $12 million alone. We are upgrading 10 new boilers that is going to come out of this funding. 
We will be taking care of indoor air quality uh, situations at more than half of our schools, upgrading the indoor air quality for our staff and students throughout the district. This program will go on for, I'll be long gone, but the program will continue and, and this will continue to upgrade the facilities in the district. Now, Fund 15, these are only the school-based budgets, and we have to account the revenue and the expenditures by school for those schools required to prepare school-based budgets for what they, we call whole school reform. So districts with schools preparing these budgets must record all of the revenue and expenditures for each school separately in character class 15. Now, Fund 30, capital projects. If we're paying particular capital projects, sometimes we have to budget them in Fund 30 to record and keep track of those. These are very high-costing capital improvements. And it's, it, it creates a separate accounting, which is what the department requires you to do so that when it is subject to audit and review by the county office, you have those accounted for how you spent the money for these, those particular projects. Again, Fund 40 is debt service. Fund 60 is food services. Fund 60 is for any uh, income that we receive. It is not tax levy money. This is what we receive uh, that goes in from our food service programs. Uh, and uh, these are not subject to tax levy. Uh, we're very fortunate that we do not have to make a contribution from the general fund, from the general fund to the food uh, service account. There are districts that have to do that, but that requires, again, special approval by the executive county superintendent. Now, finally, when we get to calculating the budget, it's not like we throw everything up in the end, we hope it's gonna fall into one pot. We have to take our local tax levy, and whatever the local tax levy is, if there is an increase there, let's say the general 2%, it's 2% of that particular levy, not 2% of the entire billion dollar budget. So it's just 2% of the levy. So you take your to local tax levy plus your payroll tax. Now the payroll tax we've been receiving, it's really been $65 million. I am hoping to have an audit of it, and I am anticipating that we will receive some additional payroll tax from the city of Jersey City. But right now, I anticipate the 65 million, but I am expecting additional monies. So you include the local tax levy, the payroll tax. Then any miscellaneous revenue or interest that we expect to have, we have a number, we put that in there. Then whatever our state aid is, that gets thrown into the mix. And then how much we're going to budget from our extraordinary aid, whether we do the whole thing or we do a partial of it, that gets thrown into the mix. The SEMI, or the Special Education Medication Initiative, that number's already in the budget, that has to be there. Then if we do have unexpended appropriations from 23-24, we will put them in 24-25 then we have to formulate our capital outlay budget. If we're going to make an additional deposit and we anticipate to do that into capital reserve, plus any other items that we may need moving forward. Then a big item is the transfer to charter schools. This is very costly for Jersey City because we have 21 charter schools and the expense to the budget is almost $170 million, actually 20%. So there is an item in the budget that says transfer to charter schools. And the department is part of the software. They will send us exactly what the enrollment is anticipated for the charter schools that Jersey City will be paying for. And whatever those that bottom line is, we have to put it into the budget. It has to match exactly or the budget will not be approved. We will get a fatal edit and then we'll have to deal with that with the county superintendent. So we have no choice on the charter school. And if more charter schools open, we have to fund them. That's just the way it is. Then we take our whatever our special revenue is, we anticipate that will go into the budget. 
And then because we are a Title I district, uh, there's a contribution that comes from the Title I funds, Fund 20, that uh, goes to the school-based budget and at least decreases the Fund 15 a little bit. So when we put all of those numbers together, that's how we wound up with the billion dollar budget for this school year. Now I have here for the 23-24, our original budget was $1,537,924. This included the $3 million that we appropriated from the extraordinary aid. Now as a result of the severe reduction in state aid for this school year, and Jersey City was the highest to, I went on to say not to receive, but we were the highest reduction of any school district, $51 million. Now, how do you make up $51 million? I mean, you, you can't cut pencils and papers and, uh, and, and supplies. You have to look at staffing. However, the legislature acted pretty quickly before the final budget was due and they passed the measure, so Jersey City received what they call supplemental stabilization aid of $33,701,019. So that's where the final budget then was adopted at $1,035,238,943. Now we're expecting, there was a formula that was put in that was over six years. And the 24-25 school year will be the last year for this reduction. Although the estimated uh, reduction for last school year was estimated at $31 million. We were reduced by 51 because the net assessed evaluation for Jersey City went up. When that goes up, that's very good for you taxpayers because your tax levy goes down. However, it's not good for the district because when, the, when, when that goes up, the state aid goes down. Hence, the reason we lost an additional $20 million. But the legislature acted. We received $33 million back, but we were still short $20 million bucks. However, because of the unexpended appropriations from the previous year and the excess surplus and very careful spending over the school year, we were able to make up the difference. So that when we increased the budget, even though it was by 27 million, we only had to increase the tax levy by 2%. And we even thought about not doing that, but however, we were required by the department when we got the software, you are required to do a minimum tax levy of 2%. That's the only reason we did it. However, it, it wound up being a reduction for the taxpayers on the average assessment because the net assets evaluation went up. So there was a decrease of $51 which was at least a little relief from the tax, for the taxpayer because the two previous years, they were hit very heavy by tax levy increases to the budget. I did have two uh, charts just giving you the pie chart, which you can see that uh, the blue section is a little more than 50%. That comes from you local taxpayers. Then you have state aid, payroll tax, and uh, other funds that make up the total budget and also then a little pie chart on the expenditures and how we, we uh, take care of that. Uh, uh, putting a budget together of this size is, is not an easy task, but working together, we have a very good finance committee uh, who will be working with us, and we are, first thing the superintendent says to me, I wanna know if we gotta increase the taxes. So we try to make sure that we, we can put the budget in with, and if we have to increase the budget and it requires a tax levy to be as fair and as appropriate as possible. Uh, so I hope that explains a little bit of how the mythical budget gets together. And when I look at a billion dollars, sometimes I feel like I'm playing Monopoly by moving these zeros around. It, it's, it's, uh, but we have almost 5,000 staff members benefits and, 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 and all kinds of workers throughout the district. And of course, we have to fund our programs moving forward. 
So uh, I think uh, we'll be able to move on for questions at this particular point. I will do my best to answer them. Whatever I don't know, I will get you an answer. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernafel. Um, members of the public, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. McKenzie, Ms. Marion McKenzie, who is the uh, secretary to the board, so that we can organize the questions. Each of you, there's not that many people here, so I'm pretty certain that you'll be able to ask more than one question, if time permits. So I think we could probably line up by the microphone because we do have a live mic set up. And so everyone um, just in turn, and then when the line concludes, feel free to uh, come back for a second round if you wish. So without further ado, we'll begin with the questions. Thank you. Hi. Hello, Erica. How are Hello. you? Thank you for coming. Yes. I have to say, well, first of all, good evening. Good evening. Superintendent, hi. Um, congratulations to the new trustees. Hello, senior administration. Um, I have to start off with a comment. Dr. Fanalfo, thank you. That was actually illuminating. Um, my comment, it goes back to communication, and I know that you touched upon this in your opening remarks, but we have uh, maybe 280,000 people living in Jersey City, and this is what came out for this meeting, and I attribute that to the lack of time. You know, you didn't advertise it well. And then to hold the meeting the same day that the city council's meeting to discuss the Persian Field Rink. We know a lot of our parents are over there at that meeting. Saying that you invited city council members to this town hall, how are they supposed to attend when they have to attend to their own duties as city council members? So, I feel that we continue to take missteps when it comes to communication. Um, it, I hate to say this because I know all of you work really hard to do what you do and you give a lot of your own time, but it almost seems performative. Like, hey, here we go. We're supposed to have two public meetings about the budget. Here's one. Um, and when it's poorly attended, really we're not reaching the goal of true transformative or effective community engagement. So I just wanted to say that. And When you put these meetings together, I think you really, and I understand that everything takes a long time, but that you have to give people the opportunity to come by giving them as much time as possible by, because when the first announcement went out on the app, it didn't even say what the topic was. It didn't say who was hosting it, it just said come to the town hall. So when people don't know what's going to be discussed, they're going to turn away from that. Um, so I'm hoping we can do better in the future, but I, do, I am grateful for having these discussions. I want to know regarding the tax levy, so, I personally had to pay 3500 into my escrow account to keep my payments the same because of the tax levy. And going forward, we've just signed the contracts for the teachers. We've renewed, we're renewing all these contracts. And I believe that teachers deserve every single penny that they do get. But I do have a question. Dr. Fanoffel, you said, 80% goes to staffing, 20% goes to charter schools. What is that leaving for our students? And how are we going to make up this, what's going to be a shortfall 
and staffing when we're going to increase just the teachers. I'm not talking about the power that you know the Paris or 2262. They're getting a four percent increase over the each year for the next four years, which is going to, it's going to be more than 16 percent of 80 percent of the budget, and that's just teachers. How are we going to deal that with that budget-wise? Is that going to turn into bringing back where many teachers get rift, large class sizes, which at this point the sisters can't really, because we've had so much learning loss, we can't afford to go back to that. So I want to know what we're doing so that we don't continue to put the burden because it's the same people that you're taking every time we increase the tax levy, it's the same group of people that carry that burden. And that's the small dwelling, single family property owners. And I want, I want all our children to get the best education that they possibly can, but when you start driving out those people that you're supposed to be helping, what are we doing? You know? So that was my first question. Okay. Uh, actually, to, it's very difficult to project. You have to estimate, of course, future budgets. But however, uh, Jersey City does, uh, I'm not, I'm discounting the ESSA funding because that's gone, but we still get about $180 million in, in grants. That certainly helps the district because we do a lot of staffing with that. When I say staff, I mean the entire staffing, not only teachers, but our maintenance custodial, our administrators, the entire budget. And when you take the whole budget and you put it together, yeah, you have, you come up with a percentage to say, well, this is what's the salary. Salaries is your biggest part of the budget, no matter what. Even, even dismissing the, the charter schools. Um, so what we try to do is we, as we go through the year, we do have excess surplus that we already, that we had from last year that we put aside for the 24-25 budget. And we have been very um, cognizant of our spending practices this school year, as I did last school year, which provided me with $13 million of additional unexpended money to put into the, this budget. I anticipate that I will have a good amount of money unexpended from this year to put into next year with the excess surplus. And again, I, it's all going to depend on the state aid. This is going to be, a, and Jersey City was hit very hard with the reductions prior to my coming back to the district, because I started in this district in 1970. I started here as a janitor, I want you to know. So they kind of got the janitor back to do the cleanup. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, we're very cognizant of that. Like, like for instance now, we're looking at our, all of our expenditures for the year. We're, we're beginning now to close those budgets down. People have had enough time to spend their money. If they need certain things, we do. But then we begin to formulate what we will have in unexpended appropriations. So those numbers will assist us in putting the final budget together because we already know we've settled all of our contracts moving forward. Those are done. Thank God for that. Now, at least the next three years, you have labor peace. Uh, and then we will formulate. It's the state aid number that is going to be the problem for us this year. And uh, there's discussion in Trenton about modifying the School Reform Act, but it's the last year. And I'm concerned that the net assessed evaluation will go up again this year, which will mean we'll get a heftier cut in state aid. It may not be the estimated 10 million that they, when they put this formula together, it could be 20, 25, 30 million. Uh, so we're hoping that the legislature will take that into consideration to fully fund our districts. Uh, for instance, we received notice today that they put money aside for facility projects and Jersey City was very lucky. We're gonna get almost $4 million in additional facilities to upgrade our facilities. So that means I don't have to budget that. So with those types of incentives, 
We're going, and we take advantage of every grant opportunity that we can have. Uh, the SDA has put out other kinds of money. So the less money I have to budget there goes to the instructional program. But what we're trying to do, if we spend a dollar, we'd like to say, and this is just an estimate, that, well, 70% of the dollar is going into the instructional, it's going into the classroom. Where sometimes it's 50 cents, and 50 cents goes for everything else. But we're trying to put more and more of the dollar into an instructional program, which is what we're supposed to be doing. So it, it, it's sometimes it's a shoot, but uh, I think planning, and we've done that since I've been here now a whole year, uh, I feel pretty confident only if the state aid is, and, and when I put the budget together, I will estimate flat state aid. Like whatever we got, I'll estimate that as a starting point. So if we're flat, we might still be okay. But if we get a hefty reduction, there'll be an issue. And then, of course, that's up to the administration and the board to take that into consideration because they say, well, if we need all of this money and we have to do this, well, how, how do we want to conserve and try to, you know, make it better? And, and it's a process. It's a process. I thank you. Thank you. I, I also want to take on the communications portion to your point because that, I, I, I want to take responsibility for it. And just to um, reiterate, not to make excuses, from the moment that the goal was set, I think in summertime, we have uh, done our best to attempt to organize something like this, I think between October and November. And we realized just how much happens in a month, even though that you would think we only have two meetings per month, but between the school events and the committee meetings and everything else. And so what we realized at some point is between the snow days and these events, we're already in January. And we established a board goal to hold quarterly town halls. And so part of the effort here was let's not get into February without having completed a goal. That does not... Um, excuse or negate everything that you pointed out and you're absolutely right I just want to you know take that responsibility upon myself and just credit the administration by basically putting this together at the last minute at, at my request and also the new trustees you know who definitely don't deserve any criticism for this because they're literally hitting the ground running they just joined the board on the 11th of January and they I think have put in you know 20 plus hours of just meetings you know and things like that so you're absolutely right. This is a learning process. Uh, I approach this with let's see how well we can do this and what are what will be our best practices from this and what will be, you know, what we can improve on. Because we do intend to hold at least two other town halls prior to the completion of the school year and have them be thematically focused on the strategic plan priorities you know, such as the educational programs. Our hope was to do that prior to, let's say, the testing period, because that's when all the parents will want to know about magnet program acceptances, high school, you know, things like that. So that, I'm putting the goal out there and just watch us through the meetings as we struggle to organize and make sure that we do it right next time coming, but thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I have uh, one all-encompassing question, um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, in terms of the budget for this year and going into next year's budget planning, how are you incorporating for savings or shortfalls with implementation of the long-range facility plan the ESIP program, and also dealing with the actual amount that should be collected for the payroll tax. I'm just going to say thank you, Trustee Lorenzo, <laughs> for, your, for, for your information. But um, uh, we, are, we are formulating uh, how we're going to get an accounting of the payroll tax. Uh, uh, strategy and how we're going to get that information from the city of Jersey City, which we may have to get a little more creative in making sure that we get those numbers. Uh, as far as the, the other uh, budget is concerned, uh, we've taken a look at what we've used in the ESSA funds, 
and anything that has been supported by ESSA funds either will not be available or will go into the general fund. That will be on a case-by-case -case basis. We are, as I say, we are expecting um, uh, to have unexpended appropriations. We do have excess surplus from previous year. Again, that state aid number is as us hanging out there. And that's what I'm concerned about because I do, I, I feel, this is my own, I, I'm just from the gut that I think the net assessed evaluation is going to increase again for Jersey City, which is good for the taxpayers because their numbers will go down, but the state aid will also go down with it. So I'm, I'm really hoping that the legislature is going to really act as they said they would. And I know they've been, we've been working through the New Jersey school business officials uh, who has the commissioner's ear uh, and, and the governor's ear to see that we get fully funded. Thank you. And Madam President, if you don't mind, I just wanted to, uh, Trustee Richardson, just to let him know that we are in plans of opening up conversations with the city of Jersey City to make sure uh, that we bridge that gap. So uh, talks are in, uh, in the works of that. Absolutely, and thank you for that. And I do applaud the new board members with, you know, I don't know if anyone um, noted at the reorganization meeting of the board, we had several council members come in and express their willingness to work together. So we're hoping that that was a sign of good things to come and, and an op a more open dialogue regarding things such as the payroll tax. Anyone else? Good evening. I good just evening. have a few questions, and I'm happy to just read them and then see if whatever you can answer. Um, and I've grouped them into three categories. So the first one, can, I just wanted to confirm that the charter funding went from 129 million up to 170 million. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? That is correct. And, and that came about with like, it was like a two week notice. Okay. Can, can you, um, so this, that goes, okay, thank you. And that goes along with sort of a, um, this grouping that I'm calling clarity, which is can you, can you, can you publish more detail in the budget presentation this year than just the user-friendly budget because like p for instance publishing the list you said 20 charter schools so and that's fine like whatever the number is but as you as you go out to the community and they are trying to understand where all this investment is going like that's a huge number and if you can list the charter schools, it, it might help. Because those, those kids are Jersey, Jersey City kids and they're going to those schools and the money follows the children and that's like, and when you explain it that way, people will get it. But if you can include the list, and it used to be that the list of the schools was in the budget presentation, but last year it wasn't. So that was one ask. If like, provide that kind of detail so that taxpayers can kind of see why, like what's happening there. Because it's such a big number that's going through your budget. It is true, but th this year when we did the budget, I had the board's eye view of the budget and it did include the names of all of the charter schools and the total number of students, which was 6,791 as part of that. But the user-friendly budget is generated by the budget software. So it, it so just I'm gives... It just gives that information for that, but you want us to do something a little no, additional. So, we so can look whatever, at that. We can so look at that. So whatever document you're referring to, can you put that on your website? Because I, I, I certainly will. Yeah, it's that would be great. That would be great. Board's okay. eye view of the budget. That would be great. I think that would be really helpful. Can you also, is there a way you can publish the weighted enrollment so that we can see the investment in the chat, in the in each student based on a weighted enrollment, a weighted average enrollment, because to, because the state publishes this misleading figure, which is the per pupil cost, but they don't take into account the weighted enrollment, and it's an issue because it's misleading. It's, it's true. The, the weighted enrollment is a calculation that we all, all the business administrators have trouble with. It yeah. Because we don't know how, actually how they came up with it. But we do get a number, we, when we get our state aid, we get this calculation. We certainly can share that because it's yeah, a public Yeah, I think it would be helpful because it's not public anywhere else. And, and I'm state. making a note of that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, can you, it was a very helpful breakdown of the funds. And I noticed in, again, in the user-friendly budget, which was what I had reference to, that the only place the fund is referenced is in the two-digit prefix next under the account column. Can you perhaps group, because that was a very helpful slide you had, 
where you, where you explain the different funds and what each fund is for. And just to group um, each itemized investment based on the fund, it might just be helpful. Um, and then uh, from a, from a um, just two more, three more questions, I'm sorry. Do you know the size of the tax base for next year? Are you given that information? Actually, it will be part of the budget software when they release it to me. And that will come uh, when you get the state aid numbers? No, the, usually that comes out. Uh, yeah, but then it changes once you get the state aid numbers because okay. then, you know. Okay. That's how, I, that's how I found out that the net assessed evaluation right. went up and then it put off in my uh, I said, I got a feeling if that goes up, my state aid's going down. Right. And that's how I figured it out. Right. Okay. Um, that would be helpful to see as well, because I don't know how obvious that is, and I don't know where it's published other than sometimes on some state websites. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other question I had, there are two, there's two more questions. The capital repairs. So it sounds like there's $45 million of budgetary, of, of funding going into these capital repairs. Now, are these technically repairs that the SDA should be paying for? Effectively? So, and, yeah. And so if, if so, can, can that really be made clear that the SDA, because like you guys are in a, between a rock and a hard place, the repairs need to be made, but that's $45 million that could otherwise go into other investments in the district, right? But instead they're that's going true. into capital repairs. The SDA has pulled back funding because the state has not provided that funding to them to offer. Now, as I say, they just allocated $75 million. We were very fortunate enough to get 3.9, almost just a little less than $4 million, which we're going to put in definitely to the capital reserve. So that, that's what we're going to do to, to make some repairs moving forward. But no, they're supposed to fully fund. That was the original when this came into the long range was back in 2001. Mm -hmm. But then, and they're still basing a square foot as costing $143. Right, no. And, and, that's, and, and yeah. your job, in my opinion, like, is not to explain why the SDA isn't doing their job, but I, I mean, not to like make excuses for them, so to speak, but you Google the SDA and you can learn a lot about how dysfunctional the SDA is and how they're not paying for all of what they need to pay for throughout the state, especially in districts like Jersey City. And so that has a cost to the kids who are in these disrepair buildings and also are not getting investment in the form of staffing and other resources where, where that money is going to capital repairs instead of going to like new desks. So I just think being able to put that in context so that people see a 40, that's a lot of money going into capital repairs. And the taxpayers, like, they, like most people don't understand this because it's so confusing and because the SDA is so notoriously dysfunctional and like hasn't been doing their job. Um, and that's, that's like, I, I'm struck by the amount of news around the SDA in the newspapers. Um, there's a reporter in uh, part of, I think it was North, somewhere in North Jersey did a whole series of articles on the SDA. Um, so it's not just our district, it's other schools as well. Um, the only other question I have was, when you budget, when you create the budget, do you budget to full funding of, of what all the kids need? Uh, meaning, do you build your, ex your, in, your expense side of the budget up so that it's like no cuts, you just know like every kid is going to get the ratio that they need, so X number of teachers, X number of parents, or are you budgeting to a target levy? Uh, I don't budget the line item. I do a zero base, which means whatever the program is, when we met with our administrators, give me what you need, we put the staffing in, and then that's what we go to fund, which is fully funding the budget. Right. The only time you have to go back to them is if you get less state aid or you have to contemplate an enormous tax levy, which this district right. does not want to do, and then you got to, you know, you, you can't but, keep hitting the taxpayer either. Well, well so, so basically the public will see the full number that's needed, and then they'll also see if that full number is not given, who's making the choice about any cuts. Well, you, right. had the, you had the fully funded budget this year, 23, 24. No, I'm just, I just yeah. want to make yeah. sure, I yeah. just clarify the process. That's correct. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Bridget. And thank you for, you know, striving to make the budget more comprehensive because that's when we get the heat from the taxpayers with all the questions. Anyone else? Jim, Dr. Jill?
evening, everyone. Good um, evening. Thanks so much for doing this. I mean, I think this is really important. Um, so, so, and I, um, I want to echo what Bridget said about um, the SDA. I think that's really important for people to understand that, and, and, and I have a related question to that. I, the, so there's, there's debt service now. You talked about the capital fund and the debt uh, service fund, 30 and 40, I think they were maybe. <laughs> At any rate, that's for ESIP, the ESIP money, the, right, the utilities money. But otherwise, the district, my understanding is that the district does not have the authority to bond for capital improvements. Is that right? That's, that's correct. So the only, the, the only reason there's debt service this year is because of the ESIP, the Energy Savings Program, that's the state program, and it's through the state authority that the district is able to bond. Uh, that will be for next year, but it's not costing any tax levy. Right, right, it's part, not, no, no, but it's part of the budget. Uh, the thing is, with, with, with the SDA, now they, they're, they're releasing over 300 and some odd million dollars that they're putting out there for districts to apply. We're applying, and, and I, I said to my, my, my partner over at Dr. I said, apply for the whole thing, because I could use the 347 million just for yes, Jersey exactly. State. But we're going, to, we're going to ask, you know, ask and then get, but you, you ask for what you can get uh, uh, to fund these capital projects. Uh, I don't think they realize the, the, the cost has increased, especially since COVID, of everything that you do. And we've had a lot of patchwork here, and a, I don't like patchwork. Do, rip it out and do it correctly and move it forward. So, and we're looking at this indoor air quality, which is so important, and it's one of the superintendent's initiatives that we want to move forward. But hopefully, uh, the governor, before he leaves, will sort of throw some more money to the SDA so that we can, uh, we, we can get it. And when you talked about the funding of the projects, they say, well, if you have a project that's approved by, by and you're bonding for it, you can get up to 40%. Well, I, no, I've been in many districts since I retired in the 11 years. No district ever got 40%. Maybe it got 30%. So that was a fictional number, really. But it, it works up the same way. If we get approved for a project, then uh, what they do is they don't give you the money outright. So if you have a project that's, say, 50 million, and they fund the 50 million, you only get the debt service amount. You don't, they don't say, well, we're gonna give you 10 million towards that, so you only have 40 million. No, you still have 50 million, but they just give you the difference of the 10 million in debt service. And you get it over, I don't know, 20 years maybe, something like that. They come up with these formulas. It's like the weighted enrollment, you know. It's hard for us to figure out how, how they did the calculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just, um, to go back to that point about the SDA, I think the Ed Education Law Center publishes the total amount that it's like $8 billion or something. It might even be more that, than that now that is needed by the districts that are supposed to be funded by the SDA. Uh, that, and the SDA also, and then you're not permitted to bond. So you're really, as Bridget said, between a rock and a hard place in terms of trying to do these capital improvements. Um, I had a question too about the ESSER expenditures. I know that's a lot of that is going to facilities improvements. And I've been, um, I haven't looked lately, but the, you've been um, giving overall reports because I know you need to give it the overall report for the federal funding. Um, I'm wondering um, if there can be more detailed reports, and I think you've done some of those, of what's actually, again, just to communicate to the public, we have put new LED lighting in these buildings. If as the ESSER funding is reported, you can report also, this is what we did, you know, so, so that, um, you know, what, everybody walked in this evening and saw the new water fountains, right, by the front door. Um, it's wonderful to see that and to know this is what that money did, right? Um, and so I think, I think as you do the ESSA reporting on the, on the facilities improvements, it would be great to see what exactly got, got you know, what, what, what got funded. Um, well, well, actually, when, when I set up the funding, I did this through the New Jersey arm. Uh, I took the money and funded it outside of the district there. And I set up two accounts. One is called the bond proceeds, which was the 58 million we sold in bonds, and the 64 million was for called capital projects. So when I pay out the money, I have to say in the payment certificate, this is gonna come from capital, this is gonna come from bond proceeds. So then I, I have a better accounting, and I think this is what you're referring to, so that we can say, all right, from that S money that went into ESIP, this is what we funded. I know exactly what you're looking for. Yes, great, thank you. 
Um, the other thing, I just want to go back to the payroll tax, and I know that this has been, I mean, uh, Trustee Richardson was tried to get this to happen for, I mean, the, the, the board has been, this is not for lack of effort. <laughs> Um, that, that, there, that, there ha um, that there is no transparency, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But um, I, I think the other thing to, to know is that until 2020, the city was certifying 86 million, right? And then suddenly changed it to 65 million. And, and since then, I think it's the same certificate you're operating with, right? From 2020. That I'm operating with the same money. So so the city has not updated their certification not at all. of the payroll tax since 2020. And so I just wanted that to be clear, um, that, that obviously things have changed. Our tax valuation has gone up enormously. The assessments have gone up enormously. So uh, surely there's higher payrolls too. At any rate, um, I just want that to be clear, and I know that the, the board's authority is limited in terms of what you can do, but it would really be great if the city could do, be a little bit more transparent on that. Um, the last thing I want to say is that um, a budget tells what we value, all right? And so people talk about a billion dollar budget as though it, it's this outrageous number. This pays for the education of our children. <laughs> This is, a, and we need to talk as much about children as we talk about ta taxpayers when we talk about budgets. And I know that's where you start, that's where the budget starts. Uh, but we often end up talking about taxpayers and not talking about children when we talk about the money. The money is for our kids. So, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. Oh. Welcome, Commissioner O'Day. I originally wasn't planning on speaking. I was just coming here to listen, but I just wanted to comment on a couple of things related to the budget, primarily the issue of payroll tax. So there's a fundamental flaw as it relates to the collection of payroll tax concerning construction projects. So while the payroll of those that are, have companies or corporations here, those salaries should have gone up, so that number should have gone up, there's little or no, um, there's nothing in place to even deal with construction projects. So there's a flaw, there's an inherent flaw in the legislation, I think that needs to be addressed. If an individual builds a $50 million building, they're supposed to pay a payroll tax on all the people that worked on that building that do not live in Jersey City. I drive by construction sites and I see where the, the um, and these are especially non-union construction sites, I see the vans and where they come from, they're not Jersey City residents. Yet, to my knowledge, I have not seen any system in place that even requires how that paperwork is reviewed on the city side. Now, here's the inherent flaw in it. In a normal situation, if someone was going to build a $50 million building, say it's 50% labor, 50% materials, $25 million. If, if only 20% of the people are, are city employees, you've got $20 million to assess a payroll tax on. It's a process to do that. It could require, in, in larger projects, even an audit to do it. I'm the city of Jersey City. If I pay for that audit, where does the money come from? So we, a collective we, need to address that particular problem. Because I believe the Board of Ed is losing millions of dollars a year just from that. I think there are projects that have been constructed that have paid zero payroll tax. And there's no one watching the store because the city of Jersey City, under the flaws of the statute, in their mind, because they don't, they thinking short-sightedly, are disincentivized to collect the money. To collect the money, they may have to spend money. But if they spend money, that's their money. Because the statute, based on what I've looked at, doesn't allow them to buy automatically recoup the cost of doing the audits on those projects. Now, 
If I were the city, it'd probably be simple to enter into some kind of an MOU with the Board of Ed that would say, gladly spend 15000 to collect 200000 Yes, no problem. But that's never occurred. So I think that as you tackle the big issue of corporate payroll taxes, how much have they gone on, who's watching the, st the store, like when I dealt with one particular construction project, there was one person in the city, one person collecting 80, 80 something million dollars a year. We don't have one person collecting all the property taxes in Jersey City, do we? So we need to either correct the flaws in the legislation that would enable the Board of Ed, who's the recipient of the revenue, the ability to go in and, and do audits on especially construction projects, or come up with some way that when it makes sense to do, whether it's to do extra staff or whether it's to do an actual audit of a construction project, that those costs can somehow be reimbursed. Because I think that it's a bad excuse, don't get me wrong, it's a bad excuse for the city to use. I certainly would never use that excuse because at the end of the day, a tax bill is a tax bill, right? You get a tax bill. I don't write one check to the Board of Ed. I don't write one check to the county. I don't run write one check to the city. I, I make a single payment. So that bill is the bill, and everything that we can do to reduce that bill, we should be something that we should, be, we should all agree on. And I think from the school board's perspective, you certainly agree on that. So I think that's one issue, as you have whatever discussions you have with the city. I've raised that point to city officials in the past. Um, like, I was shocked when somebody who constructed a building in excess of 20 million said to me, I didn't realize I had to, there was even a payroll tax for this. <laughs> so that, like, really hit me. And I know there was another building, I think it was one of the projects done by um, Mr. Mako, where there was an issue with state, and then I raised a separate issue as it related to the local um, payroll tax for the project. The second issue just relates to um, the state aid state aid formulas. So we need to call every state legislator that represents Jersey City to task. We need to, we need to not let them off the hook easy. We need not to beg them to try to help us a little bit. They need to be actively engaged in looking at each and every aspect of getting back money that quite frankly was taken away from us because to some degree we were punished. Formulas that are created are not created by some um, fair genius. They're created in a political vacuum. That's reality. And if you looked at the changes in the formula and how some cities and places got more money, while we were punished for tax abatements that happened 25 years ago, if you look at, if you look at the logic that they utilized at that time, they look back at tax abatements from many years ago. What we've failed to do, because we certainly have a large, um, low, moderate income population in the city, we certainly have a large um, number of students that need, um, whether it's special ed, extra assistance, et cetera, we have also failed to ever do a study to demonstrate to the state of New Jersey how much money we give the state of New Jersey. So when the state of New Jersey critiqued the city for giving, and I'll just use a bad example, a left rack, a tax abatement, well that tax abatement in involves an office building. That office building now generates an exponential amount of money for the state of New Jersey that would never have been generated had that project not been done. Additionally, the housing that's been developed in places like the waterfront, but now they're starting to be developed in Journal Square, they're even starting to be developed near where I live, those residential units are now generating um, individuals that are more high worth, high income individuals. Many of them, a large number of them, especially when you look at New York City, downtown, are coming here from there. Those are additional state income tax that's generated 
That's additional state sales tax that's generated. So we've failed, and when I say we, the collective we, have failed, and the legislators are part of this, to make the proper argument. The, the things that have gone well in this city are generating tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of new revenue to the state of New Jersey. Yet no one, including the state, will disagree that the need of our schools is not less than it was before, and that to simply say, well, there's more, your assessed values have increased, so good luck, deal with the problem your own, on your own. That's a, that's a false and misleading representation that they've made. So I think that to sum up, one, the issue of the payroll tax, um, whatever way I can be helpful in whatever discussions you have with the city is a no-brainer. There, there are millions of dollars a year just not being collected on construction projects. And there are hundreds, there's not hundreds, there are billions of dollars of construction going on in the city right now. And construction's construction. It's not like if you only build a 12-unit building. I would bet if you checked every smaller construction project, I bet you they didn't pay two cents. And nobody in the city ever bothered to ask them. And although all that money also adds up. Um, and it would benefit us in two ways. Because it would also incentivize those contractors to hire more local people to work on their jobs. If I hire somebody who's local, I don't have to pay pay the tax on the payroll of that individual. But right now, we're not getting either, either of those benefits. And the second is, we need to make our case. We need to work with our legislators and, and task our legislators. They work for us the way I, as a county commissioner, work for you. So they're not doing us a favor. They're doing what their job is. But we need to, you need to meet with them, keep them engaged, have the city get engaged, and we need to go to the state to get our fair share. And our fair share is determined by our need, but it also should be, we should not be penalized by all the additional revenue we are generating to the state of New Jersey. And I haven't heard anybody make that argument, and I think we need to start to make that argument. And my last point, which is somewhat related to the budget, I want to uh, thank and commend the superintendent um, and, and, and board members for all the efforts that were done to help the, the pre-K-3 um, to get the funding through the end, of, the, the end of, of June, I would ask that maybe a committee of the board should meet now and start to meet with some of those school or those, those centers so we can figure out what happens. I, as, as I've spoken to the superintendent, Sometimes, in this instance, they declare victory, we won, and now it's June, and then September comes, and now there's the reality of the new formula of, of how the funds are going to be distributed. That planning needs to start now. How can we work together? How can we be helpful, recognize that? So I would hope that maybe from, uh, I, I know that I, 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 I'm good at reading minds, and I know maybe it's a facilities, right, because all the old school facilities, because she leaned over to Dejan. But, but seriously, I think that, you know, that was a great, that was, a, was great what happened, but we can't just forget it and be happy because we're going to be sitting here in August, and they're going to be, wow, now the num the, it's now per pupil as opposed to per class, and what do we do? So how we can help them. And part of the way that I think the school board can help and collectively we can help is how do we market that, right? One of the, one of the concerns there is is how do they market it? They're small, they're small centers. They don't have the ability to market it on their own, nor do they have the ability to market, nor do they have the ability to market um, their budgets limit how much they can use to market. We, county government, we, city government, we, Board of Ed, all have pretty substantive social media. We can help them by utilizing our social media in a way that's fair to all. I know you can't say use this center over that center, but we should try to all be helping them utilizing our social media so they can get the message out to everybody who's got a child that's going to be three years old so they're able to get them enrolled. Because there are people in this town that don't even realize that they, that, that free, that free pre-K-3 even exists for the children. 
I know I talked a long time. Uh, I appreciate and thank you for your patience. Madam President. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted, uh, Commissioner, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we did uh, have conversations or start conversations. Dr. Ruth uh, held a meeting on Tuesday uh, where she was able to uh, articulate and also uh, assist uh, the, the pre-K uh, with planning uh, for the next year. So we, uh, you know, you must have been in our meeting uh, because we have already started that process. And I totally agree with uh, the commissioner in regards to the disconnect between the city and the state. Uh, we, are, we have acknowledged that there is a disconnect, uh, but pointing fingers back and forth, we've already uh, reiterated that is not good. Uh, at some point, we have to work together. And our state legislatures do need to be held accountable, and they need to be advised that they can't just support the charter schools, but they have to also support public uh, schools as well. Uh, so a meeting needs to be had with them, and I, and I think that your assistance would be great in, in, that, in that meeting. Uh, but we have been in, com in conversation with the city. Uh, it, it just so happens that the city doesn't know what's going on. The Board of Education doesn't know what the city is doing, and the city doesn't know what the state's doing. So at some point, we all need to come together and figure out so that we can do it for the best interest of the kids. So that is in, uh, in the works right now uh, with the uh, 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 acknowledgement of our superintendent being kept in the loop of all of this. So thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Detective Morris. And I also want to echo what the commissioner had pointed out on a state level. I keep using this experience um, as a reference point um, to illustrate how what, what we look like to the state legislature sometimes. And this is an example from 2018 when I was a member of a, a local parent council group for one of our public schools. And myself and another member of the parent council, we went to Trenton to uh, observe the budget process of the budget committee of the state legislator for the, for the public schools for the state of New Jersey. And we were supposed to have two representatives there for Jersey City, an assembly person and senator. I'm not going to name names, it doesn't matter, but the fact is that in the entire conversation that st senators and assembly people from other districts and other cities that were present and the conversation each time the Jersey City was mentioned, it was in a negative, um, you know, negative light as if this is the district that leeches off the rest of the state of New Jersey. This is the district that is overfed. They have all these, you know, wealthy properties. They have this amazing waterfront. They don't need extra support. So that's how this narrative gets perpetuated through the years. And, and that's why we are so adamant to take that narrative back and to make our voice louder and to call out our legislators now so that they know that we're here and we're watching them. So thank you for pointing that out. Dr. Fernoffel, I don't know if you would like to comment at all on the payroll tax um, collection ideas and how we can collaborate with the city to do that. Well, thank you, Commissioner. You gave me some ideas. I wrote everything down. And I think that uncollected taxes is probably where the money is not coming from. So uh, we'll formulate. And we, we, we do have a new finance chair who's rather aggressive. And I think uh, we may have some uh, positive moving forward in collecting some money. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nelson, were you up at any point for the Oh, please go ahead. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? How are you, Ms. Okay, I just have a quick question. I'm not going to be up here long. Okay, if 80% of the budget goes to staffing, then what do you do when you understaff a department? Like, where does that money go to? Any money that's left over? Because I'm a member of 2262. I'm an employee in the custodial department. And I know for a fact that that department is grossly understaffed to the point where the full-timers that go to work, sometimes they go to work and they got to do maybe three four or five additional rooms, additional bathrooms, additional staircases, which will then, you know, burn them out. Then if they can't go to work the next day, or, you know, let's say they got to do extra work four days in a row. Now by Friday, they tired, they body broken down. So then they take off. Of course, they taking off a sick day. So now if they accumulate, you know, too many sick days, and I don't like to say that because your sick days are your sick days. You should be able to use them. Then you get letters, you know, threatening you about the use of your sick days. But that's what I would like to know. If all of the money that's used to budget, you know, the, um, you know, that's used to budget 
is not being used on staff and the staff every department fully, then what happens to that money? Because something has to happen to that money. The custodial department is understaffed, the food service department is understaffed, the security department is understaffed. I know that in the budget, it's budgeting for 12 carpenters, we have five. I think we have about four plumbers. So we don't have enough people to do the work. Also, if every year the justification for millions of dollars is that the schools are old, the schools are old. You know, they're over 100 years old. So if you need all this money because the schools are so old, then what are you doing with the money that you're getting to upgrade the schools? That's like when people say, let's put money into these neighborhoods because they're underserved but they continue to be underserved. So once you serve me, I should no longer be underserved if you're doing the right thing with the money. So that is my question for tonight. Thank you. Now for vacancy positions, we do not defund them. If we have vacancies and they're not filled, we don't take the money away. It stays in that particular budget until we fill the vacancy, unless it's decided that the vacancy isn't there. But we do not defund vacancies. And I don't know what happened prior to my engagement, but since I'm here, we have more than $20 million going into projects in the last 15 months, which I think is more than happened in the last 15 years. So we are putting a lot of money. This was one of the superintendent's agendas moving forward to keep fully staffed. We do have a lot of vacancies. We have, we have problems you know, getting people to come to work for us. Uh, and then we get some people and then they don't work out. But we do not defund them. We, 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 they're budgeted and we are still moving forward to try to fill all of our vacancies, whether they're teaching vacancies or um, uh, maintenance custodial vacancies or other support staff vacancies. Those, that's the 100% fully funded budget and that's where we are with it. Thank you. And I want to especially thank Trustee Boris for lifting up that public schools is what we're about. And the important that public schools is a public good. And the more that we emphasize that as community, whether we have children in the schools or whether we are part of the broader community, it impacts all 300,000 of us. And so that's an investment we are making into ourselves as a community. And yes, our, our delegation to Trenton and Washington need to keep further understanding that. So, so thank you for that emphasis, and let's grow with that. I had a couple of technical questions, and then um, a couple of comments. Uh, I believe that the Federal Department of Education has, has, or Health and Human Services, has modified the Medicaid formula, and it was up to states to then apply for that more robust formula. And last I saw last fall, New Jersey had applied for that more robust formula. I don't know if it has been approved at the federal level. Do you know any further about how the, the Medicaid program that you refer to, how that has changed since last year? And the second technical question is, as noted, the payroll tax has been certified at a flat level for years. Number one, when do you expect the city to provide the certification for this budget process, and second, when either more payroll revenue is available through the budget year or other unexpected revenue comes forward, how could you elaborate on how the budget process is modified in light of unexpected revenue? Those are the technical questions, and then I just want to provide an opportunity for anyone to celebrate the fuller funded budget and share or think between now and March how to communicate the impact stories. What impact has this fuller funded budget had for our kids, for the support for our teachers, for the wraparound services? Things that are really imp are significant and get lost in the woodwork unless we name them. So kind of to celebrate what this means, bring it to life, bring the stories to life. Because I think that will help us leverage what we need to do collectively, collaboratively, as district, city, county, state, federal, all of our advocacy efforts to really put the emphasis back on education for our kids 
and the dignity for our kids. So I appreciate, I sincerely do appreciate that with the majority of the maintenance of equity funding that came back to the city, to the city's district, much of that has gone into facilities improvements and they've been very wise and determined to spend that down this fiscal year. And with that comes the challenge to organize, to then push for funding the SDA to have more resources to come back to not just our district, but other SDA districts. So I want to welcome you to share either tonight or on an ongoing basis about those positive impacts of a fuller funded budget. And coming into this meeting, I, if my, Let me pause there, and I had an uh, acronym to share with you, but I'll wait for your comments. Let's see if I can take you one at a time, Jim. I would have been so disappointed if you didn't show up, Jim, because you, <laughs> you, you, you do keep me time on task. Uh, let's take the Medicaid initiative. The, the Medicaid initiative, whatever the federal government gives to the state of New Jersey, they have a formula, a weighted formula, and they put that into the budget software. So the number is there, we don't make it up. And if we wanna change that number, we have to explain why and why we think it shouldn't be what it is. Most of the time it's to reduce, because you have to budget it anyway. So if we budget 800,000 and we don't collect 800,000 at the end of the year and we only collect 400, our budget's short by 400 grand. It's the problem is collecting the money through how you do it with, 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 with the parents. But now, for instance, 22-23 into 23-24, Medicaid was reduced. Now, I won't know my number until probably early next week when the number will be in there. And let's say the number is a million dollars. We have to budget a minimum of 90% of that. Other than that, if we want to change that number, we have to have a whole formula and we have to tell them based on all the children that uh, are uh, eligible for these services, I just click the 90% and put it in the budget. I'm finding out for, for last year how much we collected of the money that was budgeted. Usually you never get the full amount of money, especially in a large district like this. So you're budgeting it. But uh, you always have to have a contingency just in case it doesn't come that way. Uh, but that's all set by if they get more money, then they will distribute that based on the enrollment and your eligible children with services. That'll be automatically in our budget. And I usually report that in the budget process. Send me what it is this year, what it is next year, what the change is, and why. So that takes care of that one. Now you had another question about a few other things. So let me see if I can take them one at a time. When do, you, when do you believe the city will certify the amount for this year? And if that is adjusted in the course of the school budget year, fiscal year, how do you modify, how, what's the mechanism for modifying the budget with that or other unexpected revenue? I, I'm putting this budget together based on the 65 billion they say we're gonna get. Now, so let's say we approve the budget and it's the 65 million, and then after this is all done, come July or August, all of a sudden we get a windfall of money. We call it unanticipated revenue. We put it, we take it, we put it into our surplus, it sits there for the year, and it'll be used moving forward either to reduce, uh, reduce the levy or to put it into programs. Fully funded budget means that we have, through our instructional leaders, funded all of the programs that they have determined necessary to provide, a, let's say, a thorough and efficient system of education, that's a fully funded budget, when you, and that goes directly to the dollars that go into the classroom. When you cut programs, then you're not fully funding the budget. Everything else is secondary. It's fully funded, the instructional mm -hmm. program. So we provide, in my job, I don't get into the instructional area, it's not my, my area of expertise. They tell me what you need, Superintendent says, find the money, I fund it. <laughs> and that's it, that's how it works. That's my only job, to fund the folks that can deliver the instructional program. That's fully funded budget. Mm -hmm. You had another question there? Uh, the, the positive impact stories, if well, I would say facility updates. Oh, well, the facility, I need, the positive, positive impact is that we're, you know, preparing our facilities and, and we're making it better, a more safe and a cleaner working environment for our staff and students. So, and this is just 
so many multiple projects that go on. Um, the SDA has been provided a lot of additional funding, and they put out this 300 and some odd million dollars. The only thing is we don't automatically get it. We have to apply. Now, when I received, and this was only today, that they allocated this 75 million. Well, they allocated almost 4 million of that to Jersey City. So all I have to do is fill out a certification, what we're going to use it for, and I get a check in the mail. And then that will go in and... I'm sure Dr. Fernandez has that already spent, <laughs> and, and it'll be on facilities. So, so, and we will report that, of course, to at our board of meetings and through the board and through our finance uh, committee. Okay, Madam Chair. Uh, I mean, um, President. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity because I know that I'm I'm new uh, to the board and uh, also, uh, with working with the administration, but since I've been in this month and this has been a very packed month, uh, with, uh, duties of committee and, uh, different obligations that we've had this month. I just wanted to public, uh, publicly commend Dr. Fernoffel for, uh, the amount of work and time that he has put into, uh, creating not only just, uh, making us fully funded, but also just the extra effort that he has made to, uh, uh, make sure that everyone has clarity on, you know, what uh, what we're doing and making sure that we're transparent. Uh, his job is not easy, but he doesn't get uh, the credit that he deserves for the work that he does, uh, especially seeing how it was spring, sprung on him uh, based on a situation. So, you know, I just wanted to do that. And I think that for me, uh, being new to the board, that is one of my uh, uh, better expectations or, uh, of the fully funded budget is to having someone who is clearly knowledgeable and capable and able to implement and also make us comfortable uh, in the 2023-24 uh, budget. So, you know, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I think I was just chatting with Dr. Fernandez. Like, if you look at the strategic plan for the five years that we have, and if you look at the outlined five main priorities that we set for ourselves, and ultimately board goals should end the budget process, should always reflect from those priorities. And at the top of those priorities is what? Academic excellence, academic achievement. And I think that as we move through the school year, I don't know if you remember, but before the, the end of the past school year, the superintendent has outlined certain ideas, initiatives, uh, positions even, to move forward what she hoped to, what she presented to us as hopes to accomplish academic improvement. You know, like take the weak points and make them stronger, grow together as a district academically. And I'm just setting her up so that she could say something about that as well. But, but that is how I view it. As a lay person from the community, as a board member, I'm not an educator. And so I feel that as we fulfill those priorities and as those priorities kind of grow and blossom, so just to recap them, academic excellence stands at the, t stands at the top, is followed by social and emotional learning. And you know, you know, those of you especially who follow our meetings, how much has been invested into the emotional health of the students through clinics, through therapists, through all of those things. And a lot of it comes through grants, but when it can be budgeted, it is. Community schools, things like that. Um, parent outreach, community outreach. This is one of those, you know, attempts as well as anything else. Equity, and that means uh, equitable support to all students throughout the district, whether it's by means of technology, outreach, what have you. Um, student life and services, the kind of support that they provide to students who are in need. Um, and then finally, operations, and operations is everything. That's meat and the potatoes, that's infrastructure, personnel, and basically everything that Dr. Fernoffel is in charge of. So I just want to give Dr. Fernandez an opportunity for how our budget uh, is best, uh, how fully funded budget is best reflected through the academic achievement and positive impact. Thank you, President Ayafi. But I don't know, I was taught you never preach after the preacher, so <laughs> I, I'm going to make it very short. It was about mission possible. So last school year, 22-23, coming out of COVID, we did a lot for the emotional, the social emotional well-being of our students. Uh, we established the clinics, we did um, social emotional, uh, counseling and all these um, projects to make the students feel better and for our staff. 
So we invested in our students, we invested in our staff, we settled four negotiation contracts. So this school year, the focus was, okay, we've laid the foundation, our students are in a much better place, and we will continue to support them, but now it needs to be on academics and growth from wherever our students are. We have gifted students, we have students at risk, we have students with special needs, we have students that come and show up after not being educated for a period of time in whatever part of the world they lived before. So we take all these children and provide for them. We're providing them through community schools. We established clinics at each of the high schools, and we have invested heavily in professional development for our staff, for the tools, and having the resources. This afternoon, I had a meeting with all the principals, and we talked about the training that will be available uh, through the special ed department and Title I funds for the techniques of orthogillian training, and that's for our youngest learners, uh, K-2, for phonics and reading foundations. As an educator, I know that a strong educational foundation in the growing years, in that early learning really prepares our students for success throughout their career in school and in life. So we are investing in our students with tutoring. There is another action form for tutoring at uh, 15 of our schools. So it's investment in academics that has been done. And so that is our goal. We've done for the well-being of our students and a strong focus on academics because our children need to have the option to explore careers that will afford them the benefits, the health insurance, all those things that make us productive. We have a good portion of our students who are first generation in this country. And so they're going into high school. I believe last year and the year before, two thirds of our valedictorians were born somewhere else in the world. Also, we have students in, in, within, we have so much diversity in our city from schools that do not, are not eligible for title funding to schools where 90% of our students are eligible for free and reduced meals. And we have to accommodate all those needs. And those students come with different skills and we have to provide the skills that are necessary. So um, that has been our strong foundation on academics because that is our business. Our business is educating children. We need the facilities, we need the social emotional, we need the staff, but at the end of the day, our conversations should all be about learning and what our children need. And I think the, Dr. Josephson will agree with me that that's it, that's our business, education. Everything else is the foundation, but learning is our priority. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fernandez. And with this, is a perfect time to close. I, I hope that we allotted everyone an opportunity to not just speak, but be heard. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'd like to make a comment. Um, one of the um, reasons why we're having the town halls, because nationally it's a problem, you know, where we don't have enough attendance, there's the um, lack of communication. So what we're doing is we're having these town halls with specific uh, agenda items because we want to, the community to be informed, but at the same time we need to hear from them in order uh, to make our schools better. The, so this, we're going to modify as time goes on to make the town hall much better. But we also want to share this not only in state level, but also nationally. 
because when you have like large town halls, they're usually when there's conflicts. We don't want that. The reason why we have the town halls is because we want to avoid that kind of a circumstance. So this is why we're having the town hall meetings. And there are individuals that have told me in Hudson County that they want to discuss certain topics. And one of them is budget. But we also have other town halls with other uh, subjects. And some of them are controversial. And but in order for us to have that discussion, we need to have that town hall. We don't want to be like Dearborn, Michigan, or Loudoun County, Virginia, where mobs of people come, and there's uh, you know police arresting parents. Uh, there's all these viral videos of people attacking one another verbally or physically. We don't want that situation. This is why we're having the town halls. So I encourage the community to encourage people to attend our town halls. And also give us feedback. What topics do you want us to discuss as well? You know, And always send messages you know, to our board president, vice president, the superintendent. Let them know what you have to say. You know, If you have an issue with, if there's a specific public safety issue, please discuss with us. We are here to work for you. And the board and I, uh, you know, we're very happy, you know, to, to work for you. And we want to make Jury City schools much better. So thank you for coming and let everyone know that, uh, that we have our board meetings, we have the town hall meetings, our virtual meetings, Try to part and also participate by giving us feedback uh, by email or mail or in person, you know, talk to us. We, we want to hear for feedback from people. Thank you.